This is Y490 Politics of the Internet, third lecture, originally delivered on September 25, 2012. Uh, two of the most important pioneers of the Internet um, were both employees of the, De the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA. The first was Joseph Carl Robnett, or JCR Licklider, who developed the idea of a universal network while working at DARPA. Um, he was a big supporter also of time sharing and batch uh, as, a, as an alternative to batch processing for mainframe computers. Uh, and uh, one of the successors of JCR Lichtleiter was Robert Taylor, who became head of the Information Processing Techniques Office, the IPTO, and was then responsible for contracting uh, various people uh, to do work on the early technologies behind the internet. Licklider wanted a, uh, a system that would allow the different kinds of computers that were purchased and used by the Department of Defense to be able to communicate with each other and to function as an integrated system. So there were different kinds of computers for the missiles and satellites of the Strategic Air Command. Uh, the Navy's battleship control systems were yet uh, separate systems, and then the Army had its own uh, different kinds of computing facilities. Licklider wanted all of them to be able to communicate with each other. Uh, here is a picture of uh, the four probably most important members of the team from Bolt, Berenick, and Newman, BBN, and the Lincoln Labs at MIT. Uh, including uh, uh, Larry Roberts of UCLA, who created the first uh, router, the IMP, and uh, connected the first two nodes uh, of the system. Key innovations behind the Internet was the creation of the TCP IP set of protocols and the routers that were consistent with those, um, the development of local area networks, uh, the rollout of various new kinds of fiber optics technologies, uh, the creation of Unix uh, as a, an operating system for Unix-based computers, which integrated the TCP IP protocols into the kernel of the operating system. Uh, that was followed by the integration of TCP IP into other types of uh, computers with different operating systems. Uh, the development of the hypertext market language, the HTML code, which we continue to use uh, on the World Wide Web, and then the development of multimedia standards and protocols. Uh, TCP stands for Transfer Co Control Protocol. IP stands for Internet Protocol. Uh, the idea of having two sets of protocols that really define the Internet uh, was pioneered by Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn for their work at DARPA, uh, the Lincoln Labs, and so forth. There are basically three types of switching, circuit switching, message switching, and packet switching. Um, uh, there is a video about the differences between these different things, but basically uh, I will talk a little bit about packet switching because that's the kind of switching that's involved in the Internet. So a packet is basically a set of a uh, collection of bits uh, with a header, uh, a payload, and a trailer. So the header, uh, which is 96 bits originally, uh, includes the sender's internet protocol address, the receiver's internet protocol address, the protocol uh, packet number. Uh, the biggest part of the packet is the, the payload with data in it, 896 bits. And then the trailer that shows the end of the packet and provides uh, information for error correction. There are major advantages of packet switching over message switching is that packets all have the same size. Uh, you, you, you disassemble a message into a package, pa into a set of packets, you reassemble the packets at the end. Um, so the different packets can be rooted separately and uh, reassembled at the end just as long as they, they, you have all the packets. Uh, so it gives you more options and it allows you to send uh, messages even though there's no single circuit uh, that all the all the packets have to go through. Uh, there are two real pioneers of the idea of packet switching, Paul Barron um, 
in the United States and Donald Davies in, in the United Kingdom. Paul Barron was an employee of Rand Corporation, was concerned about creating a network that would be very robust even in case of a nuclear attack. Uh, Davies was looking for a more efficient network that would work well with time-sharing systems. Uh, Davies came up with a name, but both were basically given credit for the idea. Uh, Ethernet was a really important part of the development of the Internet because it allowed computers, separate computers at the same site uh, in a local area network to be connected to one another. And then they would only require one connection to the Internet in order for all of them to have access to the Internet. So there's a picture of Robert Metcalf in the middle, a uh, picture of Xerox Park in, in Palo Alto, and a, an Ethernet cable. Um, Ethernet made it possible for offices to, con to con connect to one uh, for the network computers locally uh, through local area networks uh, could be c connected to each other without having to route them through mainframe computers. Uh, you had a, at the level of a, a campus in a same city, for example, you had what's called a wide area network with usually with microwave towers or something connecting the different sites. Uh, but basically that allowed them to do the same thing that local area networks did, only on a slightly larger geographic scale. So the Internet was adapted for connecting both LANs and WANs together uh, to, along with larger computers and, and originally the supercomputers that were set up in different sites in the United States. So um, when the Internet began, uh, there was a backbone created to service uh, the, in, the Internet. Uh, this, this was all um, publicly owned, uh, uh, high capacity lines. Uh, it combined old copper cable networks with fiber optic networks. And you can see the major nodes of that uh, network um, on the map to the right. Um, okay, I think it was gone. Nowadays, we have not only national uh, backbones for the internet, but we also have international connections, undersea cables that allow the different national systems to connect uh, with one another. And this map shows some of the undersea cables that go from Europe and Africa uh, and South Asia to go to the rest of the world. So basically um, all internet traffic and a lot of telephone traffic also f flows over a fiber backbone. This is a very high capacity fiber optics based communications network. And uh, then you have to find a way to get from the the fiber backbone or trunk lines to the more local uh, services. Uh, there are two basic ways to do this. One's called fiber to the curb, which is someplace near a cluster of houses, or fiber to the home, which takes the fiber right into a house. Um, most of the systems we have now are fiber to the curb, not fiber to the home, but places that are offering 100 megabit services are mostly fiber to the home. Uh, we have also uh, the one of the factors in the rise of the internet was the creation of the World Wide Web. Uh, two pre people given a lot of credit for the creation of the uh, World Wide Web are Tim Berners-Lee and Robert K.O. Um, both of them scientists at CERN in Geneva. There's a picture of CERN there uh, with a big circle for the uh, Large Hadron Collider. And uh, there's uh, uh, Tim Berners-Lee in the middle and Robert Cayo on the right. So these two guys invented something called hypertext markup language. It's a predominant standard for creating web pages and websites. Uh, allows the pages to be accessed by standard web browsers. And uh, their basic contribution is to allow um, text to be combined with graphics, um, video, and other kinds of media on a single page. Uh, and allow those pages to be linked to other pages so that you can navigate across a set of pages. Uh, one of the techniques used to um, find web pages is, is the so-called URL system. Uh, URL stands for Uniform Resource Locator. And uh, there's a system for uh, locating names on the Internet called the Uniform 
uh, resource navigator. I don't know. Anyway, um, so uh, for example, the URL for Indiana University is http colon slash slash www.indiana.edu, which identifies a resource that is obtainable via HTTP hypertext transfer protocol, one of the key protocols in the TCP IP family of protocols from a network called www.indiana.edu. Um, Berners Lee and Cayo pr proposed in March 1989 the creation of what was to become the World Wide Web. Uh, there you can see the symbol on the upper right hand uh, corner. They went on to create the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, that was a body uh, empowered to make technical decisions about the World Wide Web. Uh, along with the development of all these network technologies was the development of PCs and PC networks. Um, and uh, obviously a, a key innovator was Apple Computer, which in 1976 marketed the first mass market uh, personal computer, the Apple I, to mostly to computer hobbyists and to a lesser degree to uh, schools. Um, Paul Allen and Bill Gates uh, created a basic language compiler for microcomputer computers before the creation of the Apple I. Uh, then Steve Wozniak and, and Steve Jobs uh, created a, um, a personal computer. There you see the two of them holding uh, an early version of it. Um, and, uh, and then IBM tried to match this to some degree in 1981 with the creation of the first IBM PC. So what motivated the PC revolution? Uh, the founders of this revolution uh, wanted to, were really interested in dispersing computing power to the people. They were interested in empowering individuals and avoiding dependence on large centralized computing systems such as those owned by large organizations. Uh, Although Apple led the way to mass consumer markets, it was overtaken by PCs and PC clones in the 1980s. Uh, Microsoft was the main beneficiary of the rise of the PC clones because it dominated the operating system, uh, first uh, DOS and then later on the Windows operating system. The switch from narrowband to broadband networks enabled the rise of web-based firms like Google and Facebook and more recent uh, companies like Twitter and Pinterest. Uh, in the textbook that we read for this course, uh, there are some interesting questions. How has this historical development of the Internet shaped its contemporary characteristics? Is TCP IP a radical communications technology? How important is it the do-it-yourself or hacker ethos for making sense of the Internet's development? Uh, and then the book asks you to assess the impact of the World Wide Web and the graphical browser on the diffusion of the Internet.